Coming up, the latest from the Oval, where Surrey's cricket match had to be called off after an arrow was fired onto the pitch during play. Now the latest ITV News in London. Welcome to the ITV News in London tonight. The disabled football fans being let down by England's champions. Chelsea have missed a self-imposed deadline to improve views and facilities at Stamford Bridge. It's quite heartbreaking in a way that we spend all this money travelling around up and down the country following our teams and this is sort of what we get back. Also tonight, breaking news from the Oval Cricket Ground. An arrow is fired onto the pitch during play. They're risking their lives. The warning to children filmed on a dangerous level crossing. And 20 years on, tributes to Princess Diana at Kensington Palace and beyond. Good evening, I'm Geraint Vincent. Chelsea are one of England's most successful clubs and with a billionaire owner, one of the richest too, but tonight they're accused by their own fans of failing disabled supporters. We reported back in January how Premier League clubs had promised to improve facilities by August. But Chelsea still haven't brought their Stamford Bridge Stadium up to scratch, with too few spaces and substandard views for disabled fans. Our sports reporter Amy Lewis has more. It is the richest league in the world, teams watched by billions of fans, clubs owned by billionaires. But Chelsea fan Lisa Hayden believes disabled supporters are being let down because of poor facilities at some Premier League grounds. It's like we don't matter and it's, it's quite heartbreaking in a way that we spend all this money travelling around up and down the country following our teams and this is sort of what we get back. Is it's so, I don't know, it's, it's hard that they don't want to know. This was the view from the disabled seating area at Stamford Bridge last weekend, a view that was obscured when supporters stood up during exciting moments. Lisa always gets a seat as she's been a season ticket holder for a decade, but she claims she's better off watching on the television. It does spoil a game because sometimes I, I miss the goals. Uh, where, they're, where they're positioned in the goal area, I can't see it at all. And I'll be, the people will be saying that was a fantastic goal. I don't know. I have to wait till the seat at home. Tottenham, West Ham and Arsenal told us they have the required disabled seating. Crystal Palace say they've brought their stadium up to standard since we reported in January that they weren't offering enough spaces. But Watford, who are expected to have at least 150 wheelchair spaces, still only offer 100. They are planning to build a new stand, which they say would include the spaces required. Chelsea will also miss this month's deadline, which was agreed by Premier League clubs two years ago. Chelsea have told us that they are looking at ways to improve their facilities for disabled fans but say the age and the design of the stadium makes things difficult. They're hoping to finish building their new stadium in around five years time and say that will be compliant. Baroness Tanny Gray Thompson believes clubs should be sanctioned by the football authorities for failing to meet the guidelines. One of the reasons that legislation was avoided about 18 months ago was because they made this promise that by 2017 there would be significant process, progress uh, and that just hasn't happened and for football fans uh, it just means that you know they're, they're either in bad seats or they're not able to watch the games. The Equality and Human Rights Commission is reviewing the facilities but whilst that continues supporters like Lisa feel they are being let down by the clubs they are so passionate about. Amy, it's such a serious issue you've been following. Are things going to get better anytime soon for Chelsea's disabled fans? Not anytime soon, certainly not until they build the new stadium, it seems. We've been going back to Chelsea for several weeks and asking exactly how many seats they've been offering. And they actually, at the moment, won't tell us. We do know at the start of the year uh, that they had to offer 215 
as part of these guidelines and they were only offering half of that. Now in terms of what it would cost to bring it up to scratch, we asked Crystal Palace who have done it, they say for them it was a million pounds. Now obviously all stadiums are different sizes but when you consider how much just today alone Premier League clubs are going to be spending on transfers, it is small fry. The Premier League say it's too early to talk about sanctions, they're carrying out a review as well but just in terms of Watford should mention them as well because they haven't met the requirement too. Their fans have told us they are happy with the number being offered, but clearly Chelsea fans are unhappy. OK, Amy, many thanks. The county cricket match between Surrey and Middlesex at the Oval today had to be abandoned after an arrow was apparently fired onto the pitch during play. Our reporter Katie Barnfield is outside the Oval tonight. Katie, an extraordinary thing to happen. What more do we know? Well, it was just past half past four this afternoon and Surrey were just about to bowl their next ball when the match was stopped. That was after an arrow, as you said, was fired straight onto the pitch, an arrow with a metal tip. Now, this arrow is about 18 inches long and it's thought to have been fired from outside the ground. Almost immediately, the umpires decided that the players should leave the pitch for their own safety. They started running into the changing rooms. Pretty soon after that, security said that the fans should take cover as well. And it wasn't long before the entire stadium was emptied. Now, no one's sure why this happened at the moment. All we've heard from the police is that there was a controlled evacuation. There haven't been any arrests and they're keeping an open mind as to the motive. Now, an official tweet from the Middlesex Cricket uh, County Cricket Club uh, Twitter account, they said that they think it's a crossbow bolt, but we don't know that at the moment. We haven't had any confirmation of that. Thankfully, there haven't been any injuries reported at the moment. Armed police have been escorting fans outside the ground. They're continuing to stay here and uh, they're continue searching the ground and trying to find out what happened here this afternoon. Casey, many thanks. Network Rail today issued a safety warning for a level crossing in St Albans after filming more than 300 cases of people misusing it in just nine days. Much of the footage shows school children messing around on the crossing, which Network Rail was closely monitoring at the start of July. It says they were risking their lives. Well, our reporter Toby Sadler uh, is at the crossing. Toby, what do Network Rail plan to do about this? Well, in essence, they want to make it safer, but they're not really quite sure how to go about it. Let me give you a sense of the scene here. So this is the crossing. You can see around a thousand people use it every day. It's pretty popular, but only thing stopping you going on to the tracks are the signs on the ground, stop look and listen, and a gate at either end which aren't locked. And on the other direction, you've got 60 trains going in either direction. So anything preventing you, common sense. Of course, that's the thing which these children haven't been employing, the ones caught on CCTV. We've seen them dancing along the tracks, balancing on the wood that's designed to stop them going on the tracks, and standing in the middle of the track as if sort of playing chicken with oncoming trains. Network Rail say that is incredibly dangerous, but in fact this crossing has already been branded one of the most dangerous in the country. In 2015, Network Rail closed it for two weeks, trying to come up with a solution to make it safer. Uh, and in a sort of collaboration with the council, only just two weeks after that, they reopened it. The deal then, though, was that trains would come through more slowly at 20 miles an hour rather than 50 miles an hour, and they'd sound their horns uh, closer to the crossing and more clearly. Now, the uh, problem with that, though, of course, is we've had these CCTV cameras up showing that children are still messing about on the, uh, the crossing here. Now, a couple of the residents I've spoken to today are blaming the children and not the safety of the crossing. They say trains go slowly, they play their horns uh, clearly, and frankly, as you go across, uh, it would be almost impossible to be run over. So they're campaigning for the children uh, to be taken to task rather than the crossing, because if you close this crossing or move it in any significant direction, you'll find people on either side will be hugely inconvenienced having to go four or five hundred yards in either way uh, to get uh, across simply. So the uh, message from Network Rail to parents is talk to your children. All right, Toby, thank you. Despite the completion of upgrade works at Waterloo earlier this week, there was yet more disruption tonight for commuters. Signalling problems this afternoon meant further delays with passengers being asked to check before they travel this evening. The problems were between Surbiton and Waterloo. Meanwhile, workers on the South Western franchise, which recently took over the running of South West train service, are to be balloted for strikes in a dispute over the role of their guards. Members of the RMT union will vote on whether or not to launch industrial action. A family doctor appeared in court today, charged with more than 100 sexual offences. Dr Manish Shah is accused of carrying out the assaults at his surgery in Romford. Well, Martha Fairley was in court today and is here now. Martha, tell us what happened. 
Well, Dr Manish Shah appeared at Barkingside Magistrates Court accused of 118 sexual offences, including one charge of the sexual assault of a girl under the age of 13. He's alleged to have assaulted 54 different victims, uh, with all the offences said to have taken place at his surgery in Romford between June 2004 and July 2013, which was when he was first arrested. In court, it was indicated that he denies all 118 charges against him, and he will appear at Snaresbrook Crown Court for a pre-trial hearing next month. Now, Manish Shah is currently suspended by the General Medical Council from practising as a doctor, and today District Judge Richard Harwood, uh, Hogood, I beg your pardon, granted him bail, but on a number of conditions. He's been told he must not attend his former surgery, contact any current or former patient or employee of the surgery, and he also must not access any NHS medical records, either directly or indirectly. OK, Martha, thank you. A man arrested outside Buckingham Palace last Friday has been charged with one count of preparing to commit an act of terrorism. Mohi Usanath Chowdhury was detained after he allegedly drove towards a marked police car outside the palace while brandishing a four-foot samurai sword. The 28-year-old from Luton will have his case heard at the Old Bailey at the end of next month. And the deadline expired today for survivors of the Grenfell Tower fire to apply for an immigration amnesty. The government announced the 12-month amnesty in July. Critics had called for it to be longer to encourage survivors living in the UK illegally to come forward. Now, on this day, 20 years ago, the tragic death of Diana, Princess of Wales, was being mourned around the world. She died, of course, in a car crash in Paris, but it was this city which was the focus for the deep sense of loss that so many people felt in this country. Kensington Palace, where the princess lived, was the place where people went to pay their respects back then, and I've been back there today. 20 years on, Diana still draws a crowd. Flowers are laid and letters written to a princess whose legacy now reaches new generations. You feel a connection, a strong connection with this woman who died the year you were born? Mm -hmm. I do. She's uh, supported many causes that I admire very much. No matter where you are in the world, everyone is kind of thinking of the royal family and Diana on this day. Kensington Palace was Diana's home, and 20 years ago its gates were the focus of an extraordinary show of popular grief. For a few days, Britain shook off its reputation for reserve as it mourned the loss of a public figure with whom so many felt a personal bond. Uh, I think as a loving mum and um, just kind, caring person that she was, um, someone that I'd love the children to, to know what the sort of person she was like um, because she was so kind and caring and loving. The flowers are fewer now, but her most faithful fans won't stop delivering them. I was a super fan. I loved her. I really, really liked her and she met a lot to me. I met her probably 40, 50 times Did you? at public events, yeah. And we, we got on very, very well. Her beauty, her warmth, her ability to connect, the qualities that made Diana so special, still mean a great deal here. The London hospitals where Diana made regular visits to AIDS patients they were remembering the princess today, former patients, members of staff and the families of those who have been treated at the Mild May Hospital in East London attended a special service for her and spoke of the warmth and compassion she showed during her lifetime, as Carolyn Sim reports. At this gathering in Princess Diana's honour, it wasn't about her beauty or celebrity. Here at Mild May Hospital, they remember the impact she had on patients who were dying from a disease surrounded by stigma. When Diana visited in the late 1980s, moments like these changed public perception of HIV. She shook hands with and even hugged some of the patients here. At the time, Helen Taylor Thompson, seen here on the left, was chair of the hospital. She says Diana's support was badly needed. So little was known about AIDS, and what was known, it was very, very difficult, a lot of stigma. We had bottles thrown through the windows, we had people wouldn't come, we lost a lot of support, but we took no notice. 
Julian Labastide was a nurse at Mild May and met Diana during three of her visits. He watched his patient's spirits rise when she came into the room. It wasn't a manic environment. It was very much, um, I'm here, I'd like to meet the patients. She went into a patient's room. It was, there was this stillness so that as she walked away from you, there was this, um, this sense of awe. As I'm sure you all know, Today, patients, staff and supporters of Mild May heard readings and said prayers. Among them, dancer Wayne Sleep, who lost many friends to HIV. He and Diana famously shocked the audience at the Royal Opera House when they danced together on stage in 1985. They became close and shared the same sense of humour. We danced together and we rehearsed together, but she had a tongue-in-the-cheek sense of humour, you see. I'm a bit like that as well. The concern went further than the norm, you see. And of course those things I will never forget about her. Two years ago, Prince Harry officially opened the new Mild May Hospital. He recreated the moment his mother signed her portrait. It's through her sons that Mild May believes Diana's legacy will live on, with compassion and care for those who need it the most. Carolyn Sim, ITV News, East London. You're watching, the, you're watching the ITV News in London, still to come. Arsenal's deadline day exodus with more stars set to leave. What does that mean for the club? And I'll be taking a look at central London's largest and newest park to be built since the 1930s. But first, a London couple who lost their five-month-old baby to a rare genetic condition have told how they hope to use her memory to help orphans around the world. Zakia and Thorsten Klein had been raising money to fund treatment for their little girl, Amelia. But now they want to use it to fund new homes for 99 children who have lost their parents, as Helen Keenan reports. Amelia is just three months old here. She'd survive for longer than her parents were expecting. Doctors said she may only live for a few days after she was diagnosed with a rare condition that left her struggling to feed or breathe. We've been told from the beginning to not really expect much time um, so you kind of live in fear every day is this going to be the day is this going to be the day but as time goes on you start to relax a bit and think well maybe the day isn't going to come but then sadly it did quite suddenly it's called edward syndrome and causes newborns hearts and kidneys not to develop properly her parents raised seventy thousand pounds for an operation for her in germany but they didn't make it suddenly yeah things things started um to develop in a, in a different way, yeah? um, which, we, which we didn't expect actually. We were, we were actually quite hopeful that we would be able to bring her to Germany uh, where I come from for, uh, for the operation. Amelia died in hospital in her parents' arms. She was just five months old. We'd been in the hospital, she was fine to come home and then it, she took a turn for the worst and then sadly she wasn't fine to come home anymore. And it's the happiest time of your life and then it's the saddest time of your life at the same time. You know, if we could do it all over again, we would for yeah. another five and a half minutes, let alone another five and a half months. Now they've launched an appeal to raise £100,000 to help orphan children in disadvantaged countries. She may not physically be here, but we'd love her memory to stay on. And, you know, for people to benefit from her, from her being alive for that short period of time, and for us to do lots of good in her name and in her memory and support those little babies who don't have their parents anymore. And um, yeah, let, let, let Amelia's light shine on this world, really. Zakir and Thurston want their daughter's memory to live on through the foundation and spread the joy she brought into their world across the globe. Helen Keenan, ITV News. The ITV News continues with the national and international stories at 6.30. Here's a look at what's happening with Mary Nightingale. Britain's accused of demanding an impossible deal with the EU as no decisive progress is made in talks. The Brexit secretary admits it's been a high-stress week with divisions over the divorce deal. Explosions and leaks at a flood-damaged chemical plant near Houston force evacuations. And tributes in Paris and at Kensington Palace 20 years after the death of Diana. Well, do join me for those stories and more at 6.30.
Now, when the football transfer window finally closes in a few hours' time, if you listen closely enough, you might be able to hear the sighs of relief coming from the Emirates Stadium. Some big names have left Arsenal in the last 48 hours. Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain joined Liverpool today. Last year's star player Alexis Sanchez might also be on his way before the evening is out. Warren Nettleford reports. In May, Arsenal celebrated winning the FA Cup, but three months on, that jubilation has been replaced by despair and dejection. Arsenal's season hasn't quite started how it ended. In fact, many fans are saying the club is in crisis. So things aren't going so well for Arsenal so far this season. They've lost two of their first three games in the league. They've been forced to sell one of their best players to their rivals and fans seem very unhappy with their transfer business so far. In fact, with just hours to go, fans have got a clear message for the Arsenal hierarchy. Arsenal, sign some players. And this fan is convinced signing players will help Arsenal compete. Instead of us being enthusiastic, we're not, we're depressed. Transfer deadline day, we should be excited about players coming in. All we're talking about is who's going to go. It's not good enough. This is what the fans are talking about. A string of players have been leaving Arsenal. Yesterday, England defender Kieran Gibbs left to join West Brom. Today, another England international, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, moved to Liverpool. And Manchester City have increased their bid to sign striker Alexis Sanchez. Could he be leaving too? Alexis Sanchez trying to scoop the goalkeeper. Sanchez's goals fired Arsenal to relative success last season. The clubs say they want to keep him. But just minutes from the Emirates Stadium today, these young footballers share their concerns about the team. If Sanchez goes, um, I'll be upset because I've got um, an Arsenal t-shirt at home and it's got him on the back. I think he might stay and then he might leave next year. Is Arsene Wenger still the best man for the job? Yes. End of. The transfer window closes at 11. Arsenal fans' views on where the club goes next will continue long after. Warren Nettleford, ITV News. Britain's worst airports were named today and London Luton was the one that came out on top. Results from a survey by the consumer group Which show Luton recorded the lowest customer satisfaction score in the country for the fifth year running. London airports didn't place well overall with Stansted named the second worst. Now London's newest park is holding its big opening event over the next few days. Elephant Park is all part of the multi-billion pound redevelopment of the Elephant and Castle area and Martin Stew is there tonight. Martin. Well yes, they're saying this is the largest park to be built in central London since the 1930s. That may say more about how little we've built in terms of parks rather than the size of this place. Half of it's open at the moment, just to show you. Uh, behind that hoarding back there, there'll be another acre, it'll be two acres in total. If we spin round, I can show you a few things, get your bearings really. You've got the shard in the background there over the tree and just round there you can see uh, the Elephant and Castle overground station in the back of the shopping centre many people know. This has all been turf, it's all been landscaped and and the reason they're redeveloping it is all to do with up there just some of the 3,000 new homes being built here a huge redevelopment project and Rob Heesom is one of the developers who's behind this project uh, Rob green space in London it's important how difficult is it to ensure that with what three times more people are going to be living in this area we make it a nice place to live as well yeah absolutely I think that's one of the key challenges we can all concentrate on the buildings that go up but obviously the green spaces give the chance for people, the wider community, to actually enjoy the place. And what we've been able to do here at Elephant Park is actually bring forward half of what is going to be a fantastic new park to open at what is quite an early stage of the project. Uh, we've got some mature trees behind you with a kids playground there. And as mentioned at the beginning, you're going to push it back another acre. So behind that hoarding there is going to be some more green space for football and the community to enjoy. Yeah, sure. And in fact, the hoarding lines on either side of us as well also will go out. So this is a very significant part of open space for London. And across the Elephant through 2017, there's been a series of new spaces that have opened. So the, cha the place is really changing for the better. Rob, thanks very much. And as you mentioned, Garant, they're going to be launching it. There's a, an Elephant. A, what's the name, Rob? I've kind of completely... Ellie Fest, thanks Rob, and it's an Ellie Fest event on this weekend for the community to come down, party, enjoy themselves and soak up the weather, which actually is looking rather good. Live vividly, whatever the weather. Pirites Allergy Tablets sponsor the London weekday weather. 
Well, what a difference a day makes after that cold, dismal, wet day yesterday. Lovely sunshine here at the moment. And tomorrow, well, a mixture of plenty of sunshine, just a few showers once more. Saturday, looking like a lovely day, bright and fine, the best day of the weekend before Sunday turns a little more cloudy and some rain then into Sunday night. If we take a look at a pressure chart, we can see what's going on. A little bit of high pressure starting to build in, bringing settled conditions through tomorrow and Saturday when we get that sunshine. Then cloud builds through Sunday. And if we turn on the temperature layer, change of colors there, we can see behind that rain is warmer air coming in from the west. So turning slightly more humid and muggy as we go into Monday back out to tonight and this evening well a slightly fresher feel uh, clear skies as well overnight relatively light winds it's not going to be quite as cold as last night but it is going to be a bit cooler than we've seen uh, over more recent nights so temperatures in some rural spots may just get down to single figures low double figures for the rest of us now with those clear skies tomorrow morning we're off to a really lovely start barely a cloud in the sky it's going to be dry it's going to be sunny much like this morning though it will be a bit warmer from the get-go from lunchtime onwards we notice a couple of showers particularly out towards the east which could be a little heavy in places maybe even the odd rumble of thunder but in the sunshine slightly warmer than today highs of 21 degrees then as we go through the evening those showers start to dissipate and clear away to leave a clear night before we then head into the weekend and as mentioned we'll take a look at Saturday because that is going to be the best day of the weekend medallions across the board plenty of sunshine very nice indeed cloudier on Sunday rain overnight Sunday into Monday and then that more humid cloudy picture during the day on Monday the London weekday weather sponsored by the Piri range And that is all from us this evening. We're back with the latest after ITV News at 10. Coming up, it's Mary with the ITV Evening News, but from me and the rest of the London team. Bye-bye.